Welcome to the Tactical Dent Tech Podcast. You are now part of a small underground movement of dent technicians from all over the world. We are on a mission, a mission to change our industry with innovation, intelligence, and skill. But because we don't rely on an insurance company to steer customers our way, we need to do things different. We need to do things smarter. We do that through a network of technicians that we call the Tactical Tech Movement. Now let's get this revolution started. Hey, what's up, everybody? John Hiley here with Angela Hiley with the Tactical Dent Tech Podcast. <laughs> Coming to you live. Why are you laughing for? I don't know. Why are you giving me that crazy look? I'm giving you no crazy look. Yeah, you are. No, I'm not. Okay, well, I thought thought you might have noticed something. So, All right, so everybody, we're going to go ahead and start the show today with the beautiful host. We're going to talk a little bit. Uh, about um, Angela here. We're going to talk a little bit about her journey because... No, like, we don't uh, need to talk about no journey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got to talk a little bit about your journey because I want you to kind of explain to people because I think a lot of guys uh, and gals who listen to the podcast may um, they may listen to podcasts. They may educate themselves. But um, I think uh, some of the things we're going to talk about today about your journey with um, some of the books and stuff like that that we've been listening to. I mean, my best friend. Yes. Yeah, yeah, BFF, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jen. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to talk a little <laughs> bit about that and your journey, how that's affected your day-to-day. But um, I'll tell you guys something uh, that I ran ac- across today, and um, he's actually this week's badass on badassoftheweek.com. Oh. So I actually found that out once I seen Joe Rogan had made a post about the dude. I looked and seen that he was also uh, featured as Badass of the Week. Oh, um, I thought it was something fake. I thought it was something that was Nah, just this is up. like real shit right here. <laughs> so like this dude um, back in, let me see, I think it was like 1890. John um, was reading about this while he was sitting on the toilet taking a crap. Yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I absolutely was. I mean, this was like way, way back in the day. And um, what it was, this dude name, I want to say his name is Carl. I'm going to spell his last name, A-K-E-L-E-Y. I think that'd be Akili. I I think Akili sounds good. It sounds better than Akeley or Ackley or... I'm not the greatest at pronouncing last names. So, so. that's what I was saying. We're going to call him Carl Akili. <laughs> and he's actually featured on this week, bad, the badass of this week. <laughs> On badassoftheweek.com. I guess if you pronounce which, his last name wrong, Zan will just hit you uh, Yeah, up. yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, <laughs> you know, I totally didn't even realize that badassoftheweek.com existed. Oh. So it might be something that I'll have to um, check out uh, yeah. once a week mm-hmm. and see who they list. And then put myself as going to be on that as the future badass of the week oh. one day. But I got to do something as cool as Carl Akili right here. Because apparently they've got a photo uh, on uh, badassoftheweek.com where Carl was basically attacked by an African leopard on one of his uh, uh, hunts in uh, Somalia and um, basically killed the African leopard with his bare hands. Mm-hmm. So literally was attacked due to uh, so here here's how it went down. I'm, I kind of read this. I'm like, how the fuck does somebody kill literally probably the world's greatest designed fighting machine, a fucking leopard? Yeah. With their bare hands. I mean, we're talking about something that not only runs so fucking fast. How much do they that weigh? What's the eighty average? pounds? Uh wow. But if you could imagine like an eighty pound house cat. That has sharp ass claws. Maybe almost like the size of Layla. Yeah, yeah, it's she's... the size of our American bulldog. Yeah, yeah. So he's standing beside <laughs> beside him, and you can see it in this photo. The leopard is about the same size <laughs> as him if you stretch that thing all the way out. He looks a little bit of like a hot mess right about now. Yeah, yeah. He's standing beside <laughs> his leopard that uh, he threw over his shoulder and killed. But let me give you a backstory about Carl. Carl was uh, born in New York, uh, uh, raised by some farmers. His parents were farmers, and he was a farmer himself. And he was looks like a, he looked like he would have been a skinny little frail farmer kid, right? I mean, he doesn't look like the biggest guy at all. So you're thinking he might be he might be like an average size man. Yeah, I mean, you think he might be some massive dude? Not not at all, actually. Nah. But Carl is a fucking badass, and he actually fell in love with taxidermy <laughs> at a level where he took a job with a taxidermist 
uh, a guy in New York where he ended up working for slave labor, practically did it for nothing. But I guess back in them days, uh, the taxidermy, in fact, the dude who he was working with was probably like one of the one and only people that knew anything about it. But back then they were just taking the, the skin off the animal and then filling it with like hay or some shit like that. Yeah. Which basically made it look like a piece of shit stuffed fur. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it wasn't very soft. And it was uh, yeah, pinky. yeah. So Carl's passion was to bring taxidermy <laughs> to make it very, very lifelike. Oh. And also to actually preserve animals that was, at the time, uh, going to be extinct. He actually did have a good cause behind it. Mm-hmm. He wanted to preserve certain animals that one day would be extinct, so that way his grandkids, their grandkids, and their grandkids could look at what the fuck an African leopard looked like. Uh, you know, a hundred years from now. Yeah. So being his passion, he got so passionate about it. He, you know, studied it, studied skeletal features. Uh, they flew in some of the best carvings throughout the world, studied how they made them, how they put them together. And he figured out all the shit that it takes to stuff these things. Right. Yeah. So that being said, a museum ended up hiring him because there's, uh, there's taxidermy museums and stuff like that, or museums that want, um, you know, African animals on display, okay? So at this museum, they actually hired, Carl said he would work for free as long as they paid for his African expeditions, you know, got him a gun and let him, you know, paid for all the expenses for these expeditions. So this guy's entire life was uh, going over and hunting wild animals in Africa to bring them back and do the taxidermy and then position them in the museum. Yeah. Yeah. And at that time, several things happened to Carl. He was not only stomped by elephants almost to death, where they actually show him in this little hut being, uh, you know, oh, all really? ta- oh yeah, yeah. He's and several times he actually, I guess he actually uh, went through crocodile infested waters on a dead animal's body. Yeah, like took uh, like or he had several dead animals and sat them down and went through uh, used it as a boat to go through crocodile infested waters. And not That's only nasty. that. This guy kills a fucking leopard with his bat with his bare hands because that's what a fucking badass does when a leopard attacks you. So apparently he's walking. He's got this gun that um, I forget what caliber. Uh, it, I guess it was a five seven seven caliber, but it was only about the size of what they say of a George Foreman grill. So literally, it was a, this uh, massive shot, but a much smaller gun, mm-hmm. and he literally gets attacked so quickly. By this leopard, he just hears things rush, rustling in the brush, mm-hmm. and then boom, the thing's teeth are right in front of his face before he can even draw his gun. So the leopard, when it attacks him, the first thing Carl does, he figures, you know, he, he drops his gun and puts his hand up there, and the leopard gets a hold of his hand. Yeah. Um. So as he's trying to pull his hand out of the leopard's mouth, yeah, he finds that the leopard just continuously cranks down harder on his hand. Mm-hmm. So instead of pulling it out, this crazy motherfucker takes his hand and jams it so far down the leopard's throat that the leopard chokes and can't breathe anymore, causing it to let loose of Carl's hand while he proceeds to pick this leopard up over his arms and body slams it on a rock <laughs> and then jumps off the rock with two knees and smashes the leopard to death. Yeah. I wonder what he was saying during that whole time. Oh, you want to hear? Uh, it actually has a little quote from him right here. Oh, really? He says, I felt no pain, uh, but certainly never thought for a moment that I would come out of it alive. Uh, I was rather calm, as a matter of fact, except for the tremendous and wildly pleasant thrill I felt uh, knowing that I was battling for my life. What kind, what's that state of mind that you go into, like, when you're in survival mode? Isn't there, I mean, don't you go in a totally different state of mind when... Yeah, I, I would say you go more into your subconscious. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, um, it, it's such an interesting thing, because even MMA fighters mm-hmm. will train to go into that state of mind. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times what they do, when I was training with the guys out in California we would do scramble drills. And what that was, you would go back to back with the other opponent and then they would blow a whistle or say, somebody would say, go. And you would scramble until somebody gained control. Well, the key of that was, is during that scramble when you really don't, you know, uh, see anything, you're relying more on your senses. Mm -hmm. During that heart racing moment was to be able to gain control of the moment and be able to function 
while all that adrenaline's rushing through you. Yeah. Which, if you could imagine Carl being a fucking insane scramble, and anybody who's ever been in a fist fight knows what exactly what that feeling is. And the more fist fight that you're in, the least you feel that. You start to actually, the more that you do it, you actually begin to gain control in them moments. And why the other person loses their shit. And some people, uh, you know, the people had a, they got, they got kind of like a misconception uh, that by getting angry and that's actually going to help them win a fight, which uh, if you actually go down to the science of like MMA and stuff like that, it's usually the calm and collective people that will win. Yeah, because I would think that like a lot of times when you're angry, you don't have like control over your emotions. That's true. Yeah. And you'll do stupid things. You'll make mistakes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. You know? Uh, just like Carl said right there, I mean, he was calm is one of the things he said right there it was a quite a calm moment. And uh, uh, who knows? I mean, you know, a lot of us have never been in a situation where you're fighting something for your life. <laughs> it's like literally you're okay. You're in the situation that he's in. It's either you kill Did it say how or old he was it kills when you. This happened? Uh, the guy, how old he was. Yeah. He looks like he'd probably be in his forties in that photo. Yeah, he does. Yeah, dude's got a big old beard too. <laughs> <clears throat> I read something. I read something hilarious uh, that I or Angela read it to me earlier. Yeah, that I wrote like a couple years ago about that. What was that quote? They say I like to I, I like to hang out with my clean shaved friends because something about you having a beard and then you hanging out with your clean shaved friends made you the leader. Because everywhere I go, people <laughs> just assume that I'm the leader. The leader. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of funny. But yeah, and then they show a picture of him right here where um, he had been uh, stomped on by an elephant. Hmm. Now look at that, though. I mean, this is a prime example of a dude who did whatever it took. I mean, if you actually go into details of reading this story, I didn't go into the whole story, but I was quite amazed that this guy did whatever it took. He found a passion, found something that he loved, yeah, and did whatever he took to do that shit as often as possible. Mm -hmm. It didn't matter if he was being in sh uh, in fucking alligator infested waters, riding a carcass to the other side of the river, or whether he was um, fighting an elephant. God, I hope he's whether he was fighting a leopard. Vaccines. I doubt Carl <laughs> knew what a vaccine was. Wait, when was this though? This is in the late eighteen hundreds. Oh, okay. Yeah, apparently at the time, um, yeah, apparently at the time they say uh, Akeley played Tesla to Ward's Edison. So his employer would have been considered Edison, and, and then uh, uh, Akeley here played the Tesla role, which means he was the passionate one that, that had the brains. Or, well, I mean, I wouldn't say he had the brains, but he was the passionate one about the specific topic. Mm -hmm. about the specific type of work, mm -hmm. you know, which um, is uh, is pretty bitching, pretty bitching to read this thing. <laughs> Check this guy out. And he actually made some really lifelike looking exhibits. Like here's one that he did in 1883. That, um, he, he even built trees out of wax and stuff like that. So back when people was just doing stuffed animals, he was doing full know, blow. That looks pretty <laughs> well, today's standards, but think about what was he was no, the yeah, first. Absolutely. Yeah. To today's standards. Oh my, this is hideous. Yeah, apparently though, the, it, <laughs> this is But what would look better, that or a bunch of stuffed skins? Yeah, it looks kind of scary though. Hey, do you remember that one time when we were um looking for houses and we went through one house and they had a it was one of their dogs that passed away and they had it stuffed. Do you remember that? That's some weird shit. And it was like they had they had like it was in their bedroom and they had their bed, but then it was like if you were laying in that bed, you looked down. Oh see now those look a lot better. But those those look better than <laughs> the the first picture that you showed me. Might those be later looked, in his career. Yeah. 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 Don't you remember like like that they had that stuffed dog? I think I do, yeah. That would be so fucking weird. Don't you think that'd be mm -hmm. weird? Like before you go to bed or when you wake up in the morning. Mm-hmm. There's your stuffed dog. Oh, this guy also got caught beef between three rhinos. Damn. How old how old did he live? Oh, let me see. That was actually nineteen uh let's see. 
But he traveled throughout Somalia and East Africa and the Congo between uh, 1896 and 1926. Oh, he lived a very adventurous life. Uh, and he worked his ass off, sleeping less than four hours a night. Oh my! Uh, working day and night, uh, deepest in the in despite the horrific conditions. Um, let's see, he had continued bouts uh, with um, different tribes and stuff like that, uh, all to collect and preserve animals and plant specimens that have never been seen before to the United States. Um, Crazy shit, man. We gotta, yeah. I definitely gotta give him, uh, you know, uh, what's up. So let me see here. I'm looking through, see if there's any other important, um, he's things. doing what he liked to do. He actually recorded the African tribal lion hunting ritual in Uganda. Mm. Uh, let's see. He wrote articles for National Geographic, um, went hunting with Teddy Roosevelt where they drank beer together. All kinds of good shit, right? Yeah. <laughs> now, that's a man that left lived a life, right? Yes. That right there, that guy lived a fucking life. Yes. So, y'all get out there and do something. You guys need to be as good as this guy. You guys need to be just as good as this guy right here. <laughs> so let's just go ahead and give thanks to... <laughs> let's give thanks. Let's give thanks to Carl <laughs> Akili. That's what I'm naming him. Carl Akili. Let me see what his last name is. We give thanks like. to you, Carl Akili, Let me see for it. hunting lions and making our Let me life see it. hunting lions, killing leopards <laughs> with your bare hands, and fighting rhinos while you're getting stomped on by elephants and making our life look pathetic. <laughs> Thank you, Carl Akili. I think that's how you would pronounce his last name i don't know because like now i always second guess myself when it comes to somebody's last name if it's like i mean if it's something like really common and easy but ever since you like messed up tony's last name yeah now it's just i always like second guess myself when i look at somebody's last name and i'm not for sure because i'm like i do not yeah but i messed up tony uh antonelli's (laughs) last name for like three years straight (laughs) until finally he exploded and said it's antonelli it's antonelli (laughs) <laughs> he's like i'm sorry i've been taking that for three years and it was taking live it on some years. sort of show or something we were on but uh what what did i what what did i say his last name I was have before that no idea but that's where i think it's just because like we've been together for so long but that, you know what like, it is i have this thing where i only read like half of shit like i'll look at the beginning of uh, like tony's no, last no, name you come up with like your own You'll look at a word and you'll come up with your own saying of it, like your own pronunciation of that word. And I'm like, no, that's not how you say that word. So now when it's uh, somebody's last name that I do not want to try and pronounce, you'll go ahead and do it and it'll be like something totally different. That's why I start calling Jesus Jesus. (laughs) I like Jesus better. I like Jesus. Yeah. So, anyhow, y'all, we are going to move on to the next segment of the oh, podcast where we're going to put the microscope no, on d- Angela. Why would you do that? And we're going that? to I, dissect no. every aspect of what's going on in that little mind right now. No, I like to keep some stuff secret. All right, don't tell us any secrets. <laughs> I like to keep some stuff to myself. You know what I always say when I tell people I'm going to keep it secret? I tell all you guys on the podcast, and I always say, I ain't going to tell nobody else. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So I want to start off by telling you that I've been trying to get this girl on a motivational success book reading journey for probably, I, I'm going to guess, 15, 16 years. <laughs> no. We'll be together in November for like 19 years, so it has not okay, been Okay, so long. maybe more like 17 or 18 years. No. And she's always thought it was a bunch of hocus pocus. You never started listening to that stuff until you were probably like in your late 20s. No. Yes. I, I actually started listening. I'd when? say my the first, well, the very first time was uh, Stephen Covey. Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I'd say I was Wait, probably mu- Jonathan would probably been around two. No, you did not. Really? Yeah. I didn't yeah. know about that. Yeah, yeah. And, you must and, have kept that a secret. 
Maybe I did. <laughs> but, um, and then w- went on to uh, Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. It was I a book that I totally to that. got obsessed with. And, I mean, shit, I started listening to that when we lived in a little, that little bitty condo in Piqua. And, yeah, you mean that apartment. And the little apartment. Yeah, well, no, condo. Condos were <laughs> fancy back then to me. Yeah, they were. Yeah, condos were just a little too fancy for me back then. But that would have been easily 15 years ago. And um, I started listening to it. Napoleon Hill, Think and Grow Rich. I probably listened to that book. If I was to guess, I bought the CDs back then. And if I was to guess, I probably listened to the entire book 300 times. Do you like CDs or tapes? I like <laughs> tapes. I forget what that one is, though. Tape these nuts to your head. <laughs> oh like CDs or tapes. CDs. CDs nuts. <laughs> So, you know, I've been, uh, you know, I started listening to that. And then, you know, I've went some periods of time in my life where I didn't listen to as much. And if I really look back, I would look back at them times as being probably um, some of the most, uh, some of the the worst times. Because I I truly believe that we're literally, um, when it comes to like success, when it comes to motivation, Mm -hmm. it's almost like we, we are a bucket that's got a tiny hole in it. And you get so much of it, but if you don't seek that type of uh, fulfillment, yeah. mm-hmm. you're literally, your bucket has a hole and it's draining out all the time. Yeah, just like how I was an asshole over the weekend. Yeah, and then I got to play some, um, we talked about this on one of the podcasts. Uh, she had wrote a book, which I truly believe in it. In all honesty, it's I love her. one of the best, uh, she's her. one of the best female writers I've ever listened to. Oh, it's Jen. I love her. Jen Sin. Zero. Is that it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I love her. She's my BFF and she doesn't even know it. Like her quirkiness, her quirkiness, her lightheartedness. It's just something that I eat up. Like I absolutely love. Yeah. So we're love. actually, we're actually listening to a, um, another book right now, which is basically a wealth generation book. Mm-hmm. And I truly believe that as well, guys, if you're not like surrounding yourself with um, the idea of what it takes to to make and maintain money. I mean, there's literally, it's down to the point to where there's laws that if you do this in your life, yeah, these type of things will come to you. I think it's just so easy to just get caught up and especially like, like where you came from and like the type of household that you came from. Like my parents were never rich. Do you know what I'm saying? We were like, basically middle, lower middle class family. So there really wasn't like a lot of money that went around. And I just remember even like till this day, like my dad and his wife are doing like awesome, but he's still. He's really car- frugal. Yeah, he still carries that same mindset. And I'm just like, stop it. <laughs> yeah, all the time. I mean, stop anything's it. too expensive, you know. Yeah. And uh, what they had to go out and what kind of truck did they end up buying? A Titan? No, 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 no. It was the the one. It was a the, Frontier. The, yes, I have never even frontier? heard of anybody buying a Nissan Frontier for the last ten years. But apparently, mm. Nissan still makes this thing. But apparently, he was able to get it at the cheapest price that you could possibly ever buy a truck. But I think they did put an option on it. They they got it to where it is a uh, it's an automatic. Well, the book that we're listening to now, like I absolutely love it because she will talk about certain experiences that she had within her childhood. And I'm like, I can totally relate, like totally relate big time. And the truth of the matter is the book is um, it's much deeper, but it's uh, it's very, very related to uh, Waddles. I honestly feel that like, I know John really likes Tony Robinson. Is that Robbins? Sure. Yeah, I like Tony Robbins. Yeah, but I don't don't really care for him. I'm not saying, I think what it is, is like everybody finds their person that they like to listen to when it comes to audiobooks. Yeah. And that Jen lady, I just jive very well with her. Yeah, and her, it's called uh, the, the one that we're listening to right now. It's like, You Are a Badass at Making Money, which um, oh, is an equally phenomenal book. And uh, but it is definitely based off of the science of getting rich by Wallace D. Waddles. And she's just and, so like she's so kind hearted and goofy and quirky and like 
that's how I honestly feel that I am. So maybe that's why I can relate to her, you know, and her. Mm -hmm. And even me being the guy that I am, I can actually, (laughs) uh, yeah, right. I can tolerate her. You know what I mean? And not only tolerate her, I actually enjoy listening to her. Yeah. I would say you better not be saying like you tolerate her. Right. Enjoying her. Join. I was already looking up her business coaching fees and apparently (laughs) she doesn't do it anymore, but she does have like a, like a course or something like that that you can take. Um, it's like a $300 course. It's I might, honestly, I might just take it and do it just so I can not only do it, but also kind of reverse engineer what she's doing there course wise. You know, I've never seen anything like it. You know, another thing that we talked about, like I love listening to like different types of music and stuff like that, but that only gets you like so far. Because, like, you can listen to it, and it can, like, jam you up. It can put you in a good mood and this and that. But then... It doesn't educate you. It doesn't educate you, but then it also kind of gets kind of annoying. And it's like you're cra- your mind is craving something else. And believe me, I mean, sometimes your mind is craving music as well. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you just want to shut the shit off. You don't want anybody to talk to you, and you want to listen to music. Mm-hmm. And that's great, but don't ever get in the trap of that's all you do all fucking day long. Especially, I know most of you guys out there, not only are you guys driving uh during your day most of the time all you mobile guys or you hail guys who are going going somewhere but otherwise doing dent removal once you get to a certain level it becomes uh very very easy to you do for you to do subconsciously so literally i i'm listening to books all day long while i'm actually doing dent removal work and it's enjoyable you know? oh, it makes you feel so good inside and you're actually taking that time and maximizing the value of you, Mm -hmm. you know? Um, And she, uh, she's one of the many, I don't know what the fuck. I I mean, I love audio. I mean, I love audio. I like audio video. I don't like so much physically reading something. Uh, It makes me go to sleep, but there's just this group of people that just thinks they can't get into audio books. And she's a prime example of somebody who who would have felt that way and thought that she needed music when she was doing certain things. You know, like instead of like, in all honesty, instead of like scrolling on Facebook or Instagram to where you're just like scrolling down your feed, looking at a bunch of people either complaining about their day or saying how their life sucks or blah, 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 this and that find an audio book and listen to it. And you'll, I mean, like, if you're in the most shittiest mood, grumpiest mood, if you were an asshole like me over the weekend. Yeah, she totally changed, too, once uh, <laughs> we opened up and got into this next, this latest I audio was book. Like, I was so, like, I looked at John and I was like, our life is boring. And I was just being a fucking whiny little yeah. brat. That's what I was doing. I was being an asshole. And the truth of the matter is, if you guys out there haven't listened to the the science of getting rich by uh, by uh, Wallace Waddles, then you're you're seriously missing out. That's an old old book, uh, but it's phenomenal. I just finished it uh, today, and um, although I've I've known some of the principles, I definitely heard them secondhand. So some of the people that I had listened to and been taught these exact same lines of principles or these exact same lines of thought had basically gotten all of it from this, his writings. Yeah. So I think, um, God, he was like what late 1800s, uh, maybe early 1900s. Yeah. And in those books, like audio books, they really help you start to kind of, uh, it kind of, it basically points out, you know, like we all have our flaws, but it points us, certain things where we can change you know above and beyond that you end up becoming like this super uh the super person too I, I i still remember this okay guys so when when the wifey was not listening to these books and i was listening to them all the time like she would come to me or we would have conversations <laughs> oh and God. i would give her the most amazing advice and she would shake her head and kind of like look at me and go you are so smart <laughs> And essentially, so essentially, smart. it was just something that I, I said that earlier. So I enjoyed that power for a long time. But now. <laughs> yeah, but you still do that, though. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. But, but it's just because I read something that you haven't read yet. So you, you kind of like, you know, you're, you, you're opening yourself up to a superpower to literally not only be able to understand people, but to be able to basically help people. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that um, that I was reading in the book, which I totally agree with, and I'm talking about uh, Wallace Waddles, The Science of Getting Rich. 
Waddles. Yeah, which uh, he actually like changed his, his name. Why? Uh, well, no, I mean that he changed it to Waddles. It was something oh. else. I forget. It was something. I was like, why would you want to change that last name, changed, Waddles? That's put, like no, so he unique. Changed it to Waddles. Oh, that's a I probably because like he's a writer and he wanted to. Uh, uh, apparently, he made a shit ton of money off um, the two or three books he had written. Uh, he may have written more, but I, I know of at least three that he's written. Yeah. And, uh, but, um, yeah, like one of the one of the things that uh, you know he specifically talks about in the book. Where was where was I going with that? I don't know. You, I was just, I was getting lost in your words there. I know. Then you started asking me all them questions, and I totally forgot what I was going to say. Oh, about his last name, because I said I liked his last name Waddles. Yeah. You guys see how this works right here? <laughs> She gets me sidetracked, and then I totally forget exactly what I was going to say. It'll come back. But, um, you know, one of the cooler things, like, uh, that I, some of the things I was listening to in that book that I thought was fucking amazing was literally, you know, wealth is a mindset when it comes to bringing, making, and growing. It's all based on a mindset. Mm -hmm. And typically, you're only going to be capable of what you uh, truly believe you're capable of. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that really um, inspired me was uh, like literally it talks about the growth and how literally like a lot of people would think, you know, oh man, I got to get out of this business or this industry to grow or to exceed. I got to get into something else. I've heard that from a lot of dent technicians. Yeah. And the truth of the matter is, is that whatever your desires are, are not contingent on you going anywhere. Now, when that time comes, it's going to be because you've outgrown your, you've actually outgrown your current environment. Mm -hmm. And so you focus on starting whatever it is now and becoming the fucking best at it yes. and becoming the greatest at what you're doing now, because it's only going to serve you into the future to become whatever you really want to become. Mm -hmm. And, and something he said, which uh, Tony Robbins said this all the time. and I know where he got it now is literally as long as you're working towards something. So as long as, you know, whatever your dream is, whatever the vision of your life, if whatever work you're doing today, you don't like it that well, mm -hmm. as long as you know that it's going to get you, it's going to build a bridge between you and the, the, the next version of yourself, the dream that you're chasing, that you will basically be happy doing whatever it is. Yeah. You know, you could be shoveling shit, but if you know it's going to get you into the your next level, your highest self, whatever you envision, whatever you see that being, you're actually going to shovel that shit with a smile on your face because it's the destination. It's the path that's going to lead you to where you are going. And um, that thought alone uh, is what would propel you to continue and to work harder and harder towards your goals. Well, that was just like the book we're listening to now. Jen was talking about Jim Carrey. And I didn't even know this about him. Yeah. About how he wrote himself, what, a $10 million check. Yep. And he dated it within three years from when he wrote it. And he was basically living in a van yeah, um, in Hollywood. And he was taken on, uh, he wrote it three years prior to that. And he literally had nothing. But he would always sit there and dream about the, uh, you know, the big producers and the, uh, we like to call them gatekeepers, you know, that would uh, come up to him and introduce themselves to him and want to work with him. Yeah. And he sat there and he held on to his dream and he held on to this uh, $10 million check. Yeah. And uh, he dated it three years ahead of time. And it was his, his, uh, the time was almost up and the check almost expired when literally he got his $10 million check. And that's when he signed the deal for Dumb and Dumber. I know. I love that movie. I was thinking about that because before Dumb and Dumber, he was on, uh, he was Fire Mar Marshal Bob. Do you remember that? Or Fire, Fire Marshal Bob. In Bill. Living Color. Yeah, on In Living Color. Yeah. So, dude was doing all kinds of gigs, working his way up to something like that, mm -hmm. and uh, and then there was his ten million dollar check that was Dumb and Dumber. But he never wavered; he never gave up faith. No, he believed in himself, and he believed that these great things were going to come. And he was out there hustling. And he was out there hustling to make it happen. Yeah, you know, absolutely. So, um, in a sense, how do you feel now? Do you feel like um, after listening to some of these books and really getting into them, like, uh, like, uh, my mind feels so much better. It really does. I think like this year, like I gave myself a goal of really working on myself 
you know, getting rid of um, a lot of some bad habits that I had and trying to expand my mind in a good way. And I think it's really helping a lot. I think a lot of the bad habits are actually most of them and, and all of them actually come from our thought, you know, yeah. our belief that we, mm-hmm. uh, our belief that we actually um, hold them bad habits up with. Well, like they say, you're your own worst enemy. Sure. And I'm definitely my own worst enemy. You know, in NLP, they talk a lot about limiting beliefs. Mm-hmm. And uh, no doubt I'm catching Jen do a lot of NLP stuff uh, while she's, you know, telling, uh, writing her book or reading her book to us. Um, and, uh, you know, it talks a lot about that limiting beliefs and, you know, how we find them in our life and how we actually beat them limiting beliefs mm-hmm. and how a lot of times we just lie to ourselves. you know? No, absolutely. It's like, for instance, you know, somebody tells you that, man, I've, I've, I've gained so much weight. I've always been, I've always been overweight. You know, nothing can ever change. But like, no, you know what? What if tomorrow you said, fuck this shit mm-hmm. and you started eating right You started doing it right. You started counting your calories. You started going to the gym and working your fucking ass off. Do you not think that you Jonathan did that. He did. My son did did that. He did. He lost, um, let's see, he weighs a buck 35 now, and he's lost 120-something pounds. Right. Yeah. Right. Or let's just say you have this uh, belief that you cannot dance. Okay, (laughs) I would imagine that being a very, very common held belief. And uh, I feel bad because I told you that for like so many years about how you cannot dance. Well, see, you actually can. Yeah, she actually was one of the supportive pillars (laughs) behind my belief that I couldn't dance. (laughs) And uh, I actually told I think I told you guys a story one time that. All of a sudden, like, uh, you know, for the longest time when I was a kid, I just felt like I never wanted to dance because I felt like I had buddies who could dance. I had this one buddy, James Johnson, that was like one of the best dancers in our school. He was like one of my best friends. And, you know, you can't stand beside that motherfucker and try to bust a move. He was like, he was a natural dancer. This guy would just dance and he, he could flow to the music. He was, you know, he was just amazing at it. Yeah. And then I go try to dance and I'm like, you know, basically felt like I was being laughed off the stage. And then all of a sudden there was one time when I was like 17 years old (laughs) where I felt like when I heard the music, (laughs) it like went through my body and turned. I I swear to you, and she still thinks that I'm bullshitting about this. But you know what? But but let me finish it. Let me finish it. I actually had people at parties surrounding me, (laughs) cheering me, but it lasted for two weeks and then it did. And then one day I woke up and it disappeared. It's like I couldn't feel the music anymore. You know what? I don't know if we've ever shared this story on um, the podcast or not, but do you remember back in the day we went to Indianapolis at the How the Moon Saloon? Yeah. Do you remember that time? Ah, yeah. Our few minutes of fame. Right before I blew my knee out. Yeah, but yeah, right before. I remember you were like, they wanted people to come on the stage and dance. And you looked at me and you're like, we are going up there. And I'm like... No, no. And you're like, I'm going up there with you or without you. And I'm like, fuck it, fine. I'll go up there. And we get up there. And there was like two girls up there dancing together. And then we get up there. And all the attention just went directly on us. I mean, we had the, we had like the time of our life up there. Don't you remember how I threw down my my leather jacket and, and I jumped, jumped over it? it? And we were yeah. doing the whole Pulp Fiction thing and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah, and people were like cheering us on. <laughs> like dudes were like, he's getting laid tonight. And I'm like, I'm his wife. <laughs> and we got off the stage and I'm with my brother and, and his wife at the time. And he looks at me, he's like, that's crazy, man. <laughs> <laughs> Did he say something? It was like it should have been on a movie, like on a the movie way or some shit. Was. I don't know, but we were totally mm. in the moment. Like, yeah, there was a shitload of people there too, and I mean. I couldn't even believe that I got up on that stage with you and we did that. Yeah. So all of these times that I thought I couldn't dance, <laughs> you can't dance. I was being held back. I know. But literally, now think about this, okay? So let's just talk. think about a guy who literally um, had all these issues with dancing. He was laughed at here, you know, had a wife that was telling him he couldn't dance for years. <laughs> John Hiley. <laughs> but let me ask you a question. If you're that guy, 
have you ever considered <laughs> what if I took 10 years worth of dance lessons? What if I took one fucking year worth of dance lessons? I know, right? Not even a year, just a you couple months. You could dance. Exactly. You could dance. It helped you find that beat. But we create these limiting beliefs. So I want to encourage all you guys out there to look around you. What limiting beliefs do you hold? Like, call your own fucking bullshit, you know? Yeah. Like, call your own bullshit. Like, look around and say, why do I believe this? Okay, now figure out what the pillars of the belief are. What pillars are holding up that belief? And knock them motherfuckers down. Mm -hmm. And how you knock them down is by telling yourself over and over the exact opposite. Yep. Yeah, motherfucker, I can dance. Yes, you can. You can move them hips, babe. You you can move them hips. Mm, that sounded about right. <laughs> Dirty girl. No, I meant like when you're dancing. You can move your, <laughs> when you're <laughs> all right, everybody. So anyhow, we're gonna cut out this podcast. No, there's something I have to say. Okay, okay. Remember, this Sunday is Mother's Day. Oh, oh, yeah. I'm letting y'all out there know. Like Sunday is Mother's Day. She's so, looking at me with the eye of the tiger. Why she's no, saying this? No, just cherish. You know, your mom, the mother of your children, your baby mama. Yeah. If you guys don't have kids and you have animals still, I mean, like, do something nice, sweet, amazing, flowers, I love you, do the dishes, clean the house. And guys, if you're driving, just pull over right now. Set the fucking notification on your phone because you're going to forget. Or actually, you know what? Like, if you are. Set a you, reminder. If you're away from your wife, order some flowers and have them delivered to her. Or send her some nude pics. Uh, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Spice things up. No. <laughs> do something amazing. Do something that uh do something that they wouldn't expect you to do for them. Yeah. Mhm. That's right. Yeah. So, I'm being for real. All right everybody. For and real, for real. Before I get off here, be more like fucking Carl Akili. Yeah. Kill that motherfucking leopard. <laughs> yep. All right, everybody. So anyhow, we appreciate you for coming along on this podcast. Don't be a bitch. Write us a review, and we'll see you on that next one. That's right. Remember, it's all about the motherfucking hustle. Pew, pew. Bang, bang.